Hi, Randy. Hi, how are you? Good. We're very excited about tonight. Yeah, yeah, it should be good. It's, we have a lot of information to cover. Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased with the, the amount of, um, you know, the amount of interest in the program. Oh, yeah. Okay, Jude, Jude. I hit join a meeting, right? Oh, wait, I have Oh, not you. Absolutely. Okay. Um give it a couple more minutes um if more people are joining that's good i think i think we have uh, ed belding on the line here too so we'll get started soon uh randy you are correct All i right. have just uh I've just reported in okay we'll give it a couple more because i see people are starting to come in they're they're still uh they'll still drop in so we'll, let's give it like another couple minutes but, okay uh, uh while we're getting ready, uh, uh -huh. you know, it's great to hear your voice again. Uh, <laughs> the, the last time we spoke, I told you to get ready uh, for some action. Uh, you know, since we're talking about battles and skirmishes in South Brunswick. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, as your commander, I need to ask you a few questions to see if you're ready. Are, are you ready to answer? I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. As ready as I'm going to be. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Okay, good. Because uh, you're answering for everybody who's listening. Uh oh. Uh, okay. Since since now uh, everybody who's listening is an honorary member of the uh, South Brunswick local militia. Okay, <laughs> so here we go. Uh, is your tricorn dusted off? Um. Yeah. It's it's ready at home. It's it's sitting in a, a certain spot, ready to go. Okay. Good. Uh, now, is your powder dry? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Okay. Um, is your um, uh, musket uh, ready uh, for action? Yep, it's ready. Okay, it's primed and ready, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, is your hunting shirt pressed and cleaned? My hunting what? Is your hunting shirt pressed and cleaned? Uh, absolutely. Okay. And last of, uh, but not least, are your flap front breeches uh, 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 patched and mended? Oh, yeah. They're always ready. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Then uh, you are officially uh, ready to take action. All right. Uh, and so is everybody else who's listening. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Because I, I don't want anybody unprepared for these uh, skirmishes. Yeah, you got to be ready, right? 
You have to be ready. That's correct. There are a lot of battles going on. Um, and uh, before we begin, I might want to clarify that. Uh, I know, Randy, that you were all excited about this uh, program. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you got uh, very emotional about it. And I know when you advertised it, you said uh, battles and skirmishes. Yeah, yeah. And, a little and, and I know with your advertising skills, uh, you wanted to use that as a hook to get people to uh, drop in and listen. Uh, but you are not far from the truth. And I just wanted to clarify that in case anybody puts you on the hook for that. Um, you have to keep in mind that uh, South Brunswick was part of the South Ward uh, back in the day uh, that we're going to be discussing. And the South Ward went all the way down to the province line. There was no Mercer County. Uh, that means that the Battle of Princeton actually took place in the South Ward. Uh, and since South Brunswick was part of the South Ward, and there were several people from South Brunswick who did participate in that battle, uh, we could, uh, with a small stretch of the imagination, consider that uh, a battle of South Brunswick. Uh, and, and also, uh, as far as battles are concerned, um, after the meeting on the Hill in Kingston, you know, when Washington met with his generals and they decided to veer off to the west and north, and Cornwallis was coming up Route 27, the King's Highway, uh, if Washington's generals had convinced him to continue on the King's Highway, that somewhere along there, there might have been a battle, such as the Battle of Little Rocky Hill, or the Battle at Six Mile Run, or the Battle in New Brunswick. And of course, that uh, would include the South Ward, and therefore that might be another battle to consider when you're talking about the battles of South Brunswick. Okay. Uh, so does that give you enough information to get you off the hook? Yeah, I think I think it does. I think it explains the uh, the, the you know the little details, the big details there. <laughs> okay, and that clears the way for us to concentrate on the skirmishes tonight. Okay, ready when you are. All right. Okay. Uh, now, uh, to start off, uh, the uh, skirmish at Ten Mile Run. Uh, I have entitled in my book, Striker's Gambit, occurred on January 3rd through 4th, 1777. So this is uh, right after the Battle of Princeton. Okay. And I wanted to start out with, uh, uh, you have a winter scene there, right? Yeah, winter in colonial New Jersey. The guys look okay, kind of cold so and I'll miserable. Start yeah, uh, this is based on my notes uh, for the, uh, the book that I wrote um, on uh, Stryker's Gambit. There are several sketchy accounts of a skirmish along the King's Highway in early January of 1777. These include a genealogy provided by John Stryker of Kendall Park, who mentions Captain Stryker as the leader of a troop of light horse of the Somerset County Militia. His son, Peter, related stories to him by his father of the many attacks he had made on the flanks of the British Army with his famous troop of horse. Uh, the, uh, uh, the second source is John Updike's genealogy uh, of the Updike family, which includes the ones in the uh, Princeton area. Sources mention the incident as follows. The night after the Battle of Princeton, 20 Jersey militia drove off a British detachment of 10 times their number and captured a valuable wagon train of woolen clothing, which was welcomed as a godsend by Washington's troops. Okay, uh, and now you're moving on to uh, Cornwallis and the British regulars? Yeah, I have a, a picture here, a portrait of uh, Charles Cornwallis. Okay, now, uh, the historian for Franklin Township uh, that I relied upon heavily to help me out uh, several years ago, William B. Brahms, uh, he re reported in his uh, history of uh, Franklin Township 
On the night of January 3rd, 1777, Captain John Stryker of Millstone, meaning from Somerset County, and a party of 20 men captured a number of British wagons on the road to New Brunswick. The skirmish was between Kingston and Six Mile Run. <coughs> that would be where uh, ten, uh, 10 Mile Run would be located in, in that area. The wagons were part of Cornwallis's baggage, baggage train. They had broken down and were being guarded by a number of British soldiers. <coughs> Some estimates put the British strength at 200 men. <coughs> okay, another source. Uh, this is Lossing, a New Jersey historian. Cornwallis, believing Washington to be on the road to New Brunswick, pushed eagerly forward, so eagerly over the rough and frozen roads that several of his baggage wagons had broken down leaving them in charge of a detachment of between two and 300 men. He pressed onward and reached New Brunswick at sunset. A small number of 15 to 20 militia, having learned the situation as baggage, resolved to capture it. Okay, and uh, you're moving on to uh, the, uh, oh wait, no, I have a little bit more on that before you get to the supply wagon. Okay. <laughs> Is, is historian Ketchum writes, in his hurry to get to Brunswick, Cornwallis had driven his army so hard over the sloppy roads that a number of wagons broke down. And rather than wait until they were repaired, he left them by the side of the high road in charge of the quartermaster. Now, the high road is called the upper road, and that pinpoints it as the King's Highway, and you know it today as Route 27. <coughs> Uh, Gormwallis put a quartermaster in charge and a guard of about 200 men. Just before nightfall on January 3rd, about 20 New Jersey cavalrymen, led by Captain John Stryker, caught sight of the forlorn collection of wagons <coughs> and their jumpy guards. <coughs> that night, they moved quietly through the woods, surrounding the British, and suddenly loosed a barrage of mus musket fire at them. So these are the main sources that indicate that the skirmish did exist, did happen. It happened on the King's Highway, <coughs> and it, ha it happened between Kingston and Six Mile Run. Okay, Randy, you can go to the next one. I have a quick question here, and it was, is this the same family as the William Stryker who wrote Officers and Men of New Jersey in the Revolutionary War? Yes, he just yeah, sends, sends from the strikers. The strikers are big in Somerset County. And interestingly enough, at the, at the end, I'll mention it, um, Captain John Stryker's cousin, John Stryker, um, owned land um, on both sides of Route 27 uh, in what we now know as Franklin Park and uh, then South Brunswick. Okay. So, yeah, the strikers were in the area. Yeah. So I have the next slide is British regulars uh, before I go to the British uh, supply wagon. <laughs> do you want to go right to the supply wagons? No, go ahead. What, what do you have? Uh, British regulars, just, uh, you know, the red coats with their uh, marching with their muskets. Okay. Yeah, th that's fine. Yeah, did I? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, show that. And then we can go right to the supply wagon. Supply wagon? Yeah, that's 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 up now. So the supply wagons are up now. Okay, and then uh, I have a, a source from a, histor a historian named Davis. On that night, January third, uh, after the Battle of Princeton, Captain John Stryker of Millstone, with a party of twenty men, captured a British wagon train guarded by a large number of British soldiers. Uh, his, local historian Snell put it this way. In the darkness of that winter night, January 3rd, a small body of Washington's militia under command of noted trooper, Captain John Stryker of Millstone, performed quite a bril brilliant exploit in capturing a part of Cornwallis's baggage train on the New Brunswick Road. Uh, New Brunswick Road was another name for the King's Highway or Route 27. <laughs> okay, we're all set on that. Okay. So the next one we have up is a 10-mile run. Okay, good. 
Uh, now, I, I want to apologize for my coughing, but uh, my wife and I have been quarantined with the COVID uh, uh, virus, and uh, we have it, and uh, that that's uh, uh, why I'm coughing. So uh, I, I apologize for that, but uh, bear with me. So you're going to rest up after this, right? Uh, yeah, I'll probably collapse uh, after <laughs> this. Uh, okay, but I'm a trooper, so we'll get through it. Don't worry. Okay. Um, now, one of the uh, sources that's really good is the uh, DeHart uh, genealogy. The DeHart family was uh, in the area, uh, in this case, uh, we're talking about on the uh, Somerset County side of Route 27, uh, you know where 518 uh, uh, forks off for Route 27? Well, they're back in there uh, at this time. Uh, they have farmland back in there. On the morning after the Battle of Princeton, there occurred at this mill, okay, now that's an important detail. It was a mill site where the uh, skirmish took place. A skirmish with the British, which, like the battle of the preceding day, resulted in a victory for the Americans. A portion of the British Army was encamped at 10 Mile Run, only a short distance from the residence of the DeHart family. Okay, uh, now with 10 Mile Run, since you don't have a picture of the map, uh, I don't know if uh, most of the listeners know this, but 10 Mile Run crosses Route 27 in two places. <laughs> the first place, <clears throat> the first place it crosses is uh, where the construction is going on right now, just south of 518. And the other place that it crosses is behind the Wells Fargo Bank. And so there's actually two choices as to where this skirmish could have taken place. Of course, the logical one is the one behind uh, the, uh, uh, the bank. Okay, and you're on to the next one, right, Randy? I just have a, a picture of uh, Route 27, and it's actually Princeton, just to illustrate that, you know, okay. that's indeed Route 27. And the one after that is uh, a good and fair road, showing the you know, Native Americans traveling. Yes, okay, so let me, let me mention that. Uh, this, of course, uh, the Route 27, uh, uh, Kings Highway was originally an Indian trail, Native American trail, um, and the Native Americans used this trail to uh, get to the Raritan River uh, or down to the Delaware River. Uh, the Indians had two major trails across New Jersey. One ran from the falls of, of Delaware at Trenton to the first fording place across the Raritan, which is now New Brunswick. It is known as the Assen Pink Trail and was described in many old deeds as the old Indian path or the path. So you can see that Route 27, before it was called Route 27, had many names. And it all depended on who you were talking to as far as what name they were going to use. Okay, and then I have some description of the road. And, and since the skirmish took place along this road, I think it's important that we, we set the scene. Um, uh, historian Van Dyke offers several descriptions of the road. The roads were no more than primitive Indian trails, slightly widened, winding through rough and rugged terrain. And in this early settlement period, the so-called path served as a principal migratory route for the Dutch for transporting their household goods, farm equipment, and livestock from the Raritan to the Millstone Valley. This was a tedious trek overland into the Millstone Valley. It was a formidable challenge. Wagon wheels might easily become mired in sticky, sludgy mud, slowing the pace or bringing a caravan to a halt. A fallen tree, a large branch, or rock could block the path. Streams and swollen rivulets were crossed at fords, if fordable at all, depending upon the rainfall. Travelers were at the mercy of the elements, and finally a wagon and Driver were uniformly jarred and jolted, traversing the narrow, winding, primitive road with holes, ruts, muddy depressions, sometimes huge pools of water produced by a heavy rain. Uh, fording the streams was always hazardous. And of course, we're talking about the runs, 10-mile uh, run, 9-mile run, 6-mile run. That was always a problem. 
as the people were going uh, past South Brunswick, either headed to Trenton or New Brunswick. Okay, Randy, I think we're ready for the next one. Okay, this is the Good and Fair Road. Okay, Good and Fair Road. And uh, <clears throat> in later years, during colonial times, things seem to have improved to the point that the boast was made. 50 stages have been known to leave Kingston for New Brunswick, the old road passing over Rocky Hill. So uh, with improvements in the road and improvements in transportation, uh, the road became bearable, uh, but still you're talking about uh, rather rough going. Okay, and what do you have next? Um, I just have a picture of the colonial wagons, and it's another, the first one was the Native Americans on the Good and Fair Road, and now I have the right. colonial people in the wagons on the Good and Fair Road. Okay, good, yep. and then you can move on to the next one. The next one's uh, Washington's Retreat across New Jersey. Okay, right. Now, George Washington used uh, Route 27, the King's Highway, quite a bit. And um, the highway would pay, play a key role in the American Revolution. It was used often by both the British and the American armies. On December 1st, 1776, Washington and his army used the King's Highway on their way to the Delaware River at Trenton. In January 77, after the Battle of Princeton, Cornwallis and his men traveled much of the 18 miles from Princeton to New Brunswick along the road. Uh, reason Cornwallis was uh, not chasing Washington after he crossed to uh, Kingston uh, was because he was worried about the Americans marching on New Brunswick and taking the war chest, which was stored at New Brunswick, which would pay the British soldiers. Uh, so Cornwallis was hightailing it and uh, making sure his men were going as fast as they could back to New Brunswick uh, to either intercept Washington or get uh, get to New Brunswick before Washington could get there. Uh, so therefore, it was very important for Cornwallis to make it as swiftly as he could on the King's Highway. Okay, and then you have the next one. Uh, the British soldiers advancing. I have just a uh you know, some of the Redcoats uh, with the Union Jack oh, advancing. Oh, okay, they're marching. Yeah, they're not advancing. They're returning uh, from their humiliation, uh, uh, both at Trenton and at Princeton. Okay. Uh, Cornwallis was humiliated uh, at Trenton, and uh, the British uh, soldiers who came back to fight in the Battle of Princeton, they were humiliated too. Okay. Uh, so it's it, uh, they're, they're just marching back as fast as they can to uh, <laughs> patch things up. Yeah, they're retreating. Right. Cornwallis's men were only slightly less tired and hungry than the Americans. Uh, they had seen the grisly aftermath of Princeton, and now their general was pushing remorselessly toward New Brunswick in a march. Uh, some of the Hessians were so fatigued they could, uh, they could barely totter. That was a quote. Their baggage was so jumbled up in the line of march that they halted again and again. And at each stop, it was quite a job to get the men on their feet. Now, I'm putting Cornwallis in the light of a guy who uh, was speeding up and moving fast. But that was not Cornwallis's nature. Uh, one of his weaknesses was his slow, deliberate pace in getting to a battle. And this played in Washington's favor, uh, both uh, uh, at, at both battles of uh, uh, Trenton. And uh, uh, so Cornwallis, it's, it's uh, unlike him to be rushing so quickly, but he is, and the chaos that resulted is uh, uh, another embarrassment for the British. Okay, and then you're on to the next one? Yeah, the next one is uh, Millstone Bridge. Okay, good. Now, uh, Washington has had his engineers uh, uh, destroy the bridge as much as possible in order to slow down uh, the British and discourage them from crossing the Millstone River. He wasn't completely successful, but uh, what he did was he uh, gave his army a two-hour uh, leeway, uh, two hours to get away from the British. Uh, 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 and, and so let me describe it. As they, Washington and his weary soldiers, took the road to Rocky Hill, so they veered off to the west, 
Carpenters were sent to destroy the wooden Kingston Bridge uh, to delay Lord Cornwallis. Now, this is the old bridge. When you go on the new bridge now uh, at the base of Kingston by the Millstone River, you can sort of see the old bridge if you look over to your left as you're headed towards Princeton. And uh, that's not used anymore by traffic, uh, but you can walk to it. It's right behind the lock tender's house. Uh, which I encourage you to visit. That's a good historical site. Um, so the carpenters were sent to destroy the wooden Kingston Bridge to delay Lord Cornwallis, who was in full chase from Trenton. This action did serve to delay Cornwallis and make him even more anxious. Cornwallis repaired and then crossed the bridge at Kingston and believing Washington to be on the road to New Brunswick. Uh, some historians uh, dispute that, uh, this is Menzies uh, talking. Uh, he maintains that Cornwallis thought that uh, Washington was headed towards New Brunswick, uh, pushing eagerly forward, so eagerly over the rough and frozen roads that several of his baggage wagons were broken down. Uh, this is further evidence of the, uh, the potential of a skirmish over these baggage wagons. Snell also mentions that the British general Cornwallis, terrified at the prospect of losing his stores in New Brunswick, thinking that Washington was still in his front and moving on that post, had pressed on from Kingston in such headlong haste as to break down a number of his wagons. It is quite possible that some of the wagons were initially damaged in crossing over the Millstone River because the uh, bridge was, was in real bad shape. Okay? Okay, next up is Little Rocky Hill. Ah, Little Rocky Hill. Now, one, uh, sometime in my future, I'm going to do uh, the fictional account of the Battle of Little Rocky Hill uh, because it's a great ambush spot. <clears throat> and if Washington had more than two hours to prepare and his troops were not dog tired, he could have taken a stand uh, at Little Rocky Hill. And uh, who knows, it could have ended the war right then and there. But of course, that's, that's dreaming. Um, this, uh, Little Rocky Hill, uh, was area was also called the devil's feather bed or Satan's bed, uh, because of the boulders, the huge boulders and so forth that were strewn across the land there. And the, uh, the, the road that, that cut through there, a very steep hill, a long steep hill, uh, and probably the most dangerous spot on the King's Highway. Uh, this had, uh, 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 th this area uh, became first known for the copper, the copper mine that was operated during the uh, colonial period. And uh, uh, now, of course, you have the rock quarry uh, right uh, to, the, to the west of this, this place that we're talking about. Okay, and I have a little bit more on uh, Little Rocky Hill. Uh, at one time, it was called Rock Hill. It used to indicate a more specific location and a more general location of Rocky Hill. Um, and it was also called Rocky Mount. Uh, now, uh, when I wrote uh, my story, uh, the Guliks lived in the area. And uh, the possibility, Seal Leadham, our uh, uh, local historian uh, who just recently retired, uh, she said it was quite possible that the Gulick brothers could have spotted the British first coming up the hill. And then they went and uh, warned people of the British coming up, headed uh, towards New Brunswick. <clears throat> And, of course, they would have spotted them uh, in Little Rocky Hill. Uh, the, uh, the next thing is uh, uh, the DeHart uh, genealogy also mentions, they saw the British soldiers approaching and turned aside in the woods until they passed. Uh, so there are documented accounts of the uh, British being spotted and then uh, people uh, warning others uh, uh, to uh, do something. Uh, and of course, one of the jobs of the militia back in the day was to harass uh, the British regulars as they were on the march. Now, uh, it was also referred to as 10 Mile Run Mount. And 
it rises from the present quarry up to the elevation crowned by what is known as the Devil's Feather Bed. And Men Menzies mentions 10 mile run mountain runs east and west and is bisected by the Millstone River. Uh, Rocky Hill meant the rough elevation, sometimes called 10 mile run mountain. Okay, so that gives you a little background of the most difficult area uh, that had to be uh, uh, gone through in order to get back to New Brunswick. Okay, we're ready for the next one, I think. Okay, next one up is New Jersey Militiamen. Okay, this is where uh, uh, I, I named the, uh, the participants uh, uh, in the skirmish. Of course, we uh, have Captain uh, John Stryker. Uh, all these names are mentioned under Stryker's uh, Somerset Light Horse of the 2nd Battalion under uh, Kunred Tenick's uh, militia. And uh, John Stryker heads them up. And uh, the, uh, I, I tried to get as many as I could. Uh, there are errors in William Stryker's uh, um, uh, collection of information on, on those who participated in the Revolutionary War from New Jersey. Uh, but overall, it's a pretty good source uh, for, for getting the, the people. Anyway, um, this, this, these are the names that I have. David Nevius, Michael Blue, Peter Stryker, James Stryker, John Voorhees, William Wilson, Abraham Golder, Henry Kennedy, Jacob Van Dyke, John Van Dyke, Cornelius Van Arsdelen, Conrad Van Wagener, uh, Red Skillman, Bob Hoagland, Laurie Brown, uh, and then I have Garrett Terhune and Johnny Van Dyne. Now, there were others, uh, but those are the ones that I were, uh, was able to find. Okay, are you ready for the next one? Yeah, next up is Copper Mine Road in Griggstown. And I, I can tell you, this is a very steep road. We used to do cycling around here. It's, it's quite steep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, any road associated with the uh, that quarry thing, going around it, going up and around it, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and, and by bicycling there, you get an idea of how rough it is. Uh, and as I maintain, this would have been an advantageous spot to uh, for Washington to have surprised the British and battled them after the Battle of Princeton. It's just too bad that his army was not in any condition to do that. Uh, Okay, anyway, uh, John Stryker uh, was in the area with his uh, horse troop. And one of the possibilities was that uh, he was looking uh, for people who had worked in the uh, copper mines. And that's, that's why we're, we're mentioning Copper Mine Road here. And it's a road that he can use uh, to get over to uh, uh, the King's Highway. Uh, but the Welsh miners, uh, they were mostly Welsh miners who were at the copper mine. Uh, they uh, fled um, uh, towards the beginning, at about this time actually, uh, and they, they headed towards New Brunswick and, and to get away and up to New York. Uh, mainly they were loyal to the king and uh, therefore they were not to be trusted. Uh, so this is one of the excuses that Stryker has for being in the area, uh, hunting down people who were uh, loyal to the king and uh, um, uh, making sure that they were uh, uh, not uh, taking up arms and uh, fighting against the Americans uh, who were not loyal to the king. Okay, you ready for the next one? Yeah, the next one up is uh, the captain and the host, and we have uh, like a people on cover wagons. Okay. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, this, this has, pertains to the, uh, the supply wagons. Uh, uh, they, uh, they were disabled, uh, not all of them, some of them. Uh, they were turned out of the road and left with a few others in charge of a quartermaster and guarded by a detachment of soldiers. The American militiamen, Stryker's Light Horse, having learned of the situation of these wagons, 
probably from the Gulick brothers, resolved to capture them and boldly proceeded to put their plan into execution. <laughs> Ed, are you just getting a drink there? Uh, yeah, it sounds like so. Somebody's arguing in the background. Yeah, yeah. Hold, hold on a second. Yeah, they're. It, are those loyalists? Loyal yeah, to the some king? loyalists over there. Loyalist librarians. <laughs> oh, is hold that who that? <laughs> uh, tell them that they're going to be tarred and feathered if they keep it up. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, we we took care of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Off with their heads. Okay, uh, so we're ready for the next one. Yep. Uh, the next one up is the the cider mill, the colonial cider mill. Yeah. Uh, now, Dallas Hageman, who's a South Brunswick uh, resident, uh, had on the east side of Route 27, uh, he had a still house. Uh, and, and this, of course, uh, uh, can also be called a cider house uh, with a press. And uh, I believe there was also a uh, sawmill there. And we're talking about a 10-mile run. And he owned a lot of property around 10 mile run on, uh, on, on both sides of uh, Route 27. And uh, Dallas Hageman uh, was well known as a rabble rouser uh, back when uh, uh, landowners were uh, 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 protesting against the action of the, uh, uh, the, the throne as far as who owned the land. Uh, and, and you remember, a lot of this land was purchased from Native Americans, and the the the, thro the crown did not recognize that ownership. So uh, he he's an elderly guy at this time. Uh, anyway, this still house may have contained barrels and hogheads of apple brandy and apple whiskey. Uh, uh, so uh, this book might be a good place to stop the wagons, uh, especially if there was some. Uh, uh, apple whiskey uh, in there for the uh, British soldiers to use. Uh, okay, we're ready for the next one. I just have a shot at a ten mile run in the winter time. Ah, okay, good. Uh, yeah, and remember, ten mile run crosses uh, Route 27 at two places, and we're down to the place now that is behind uh, the uh, the bank. Okay. Good. So that's uh, that's north of New Road. Okay, and uh, next up is uh, the number in the darkness. Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this is the path that. Uh, 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 let me see how I got this here. Uh, the ten mile run crosses the King's Highway twice from the source in the fork at the confluence of a mill uh, site, then back across King's Highway to meander, meander west to flow eventually into the Millstone River. Okay, so yeah, that was the one that had to do with the 10-mile uh, uh, the run. Okay, and I just have a shot of the, the Hagemans rolling snow-cloaked snow poverty field. So it's a picture of a fallow field in wintertime. Ah, uh, yes, okay, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, what they call back in those days a poverty field. Okay, now um, we're, we're almost ready for the uh, ambush that's gonna be set up by Stryker and his men. Um, and I have, uh, there are several accounts of how Stryker's men arranged themselves before firing on the British. Nell's account reads as follows. Cautiously approaching the spot, sawmill at 10 mile run, in the thick darkness, they ranged themselves among the trees in a semicircle, partially surrounding the bivouac of British wagon of the British wagon guard. Okay, yeah, and then you have the one of the uh, field, uh, and then I, I mentioned that the expression "poverty field" represents land that is better left fallow. 
The name comes from the vegetation that grew there. According to Voorhees, the land when first cleared was very productive, but by continued cropping became so reduced that many parts of its yield of it yield nothing besides what was then called poverty grass. Growing in summer and sometimes blown away by the winds of winter. Hello, I'm on a Zoom. Can we try talking tomorrow? Oh, I'll be out <laughs> with my niece, but that's okay. It's just that when I call you, it doesn't ring. Thing. Oh, that's right. Well, I no, actually, I heard it, but it's hard for me to take calls like uh -huh. past 7 30. I was so exhausted yesterday that I knew I wouldn't be very nice when I answered and I knew I'd be so overtired I tried to speak. So, uh, person. Yeah. <laughs> I have to see if I can mute all. If I can't mute all, yeah. please, I'll mute No, I'm sorry. It's a Zoom about, I love American Revolutionary History and it's about skirmishes that happened in South Brunswick. And since it started at 6 30, I could actually do it because so many of them start at seven and I can only like make it until about 7 30. I just wanted to say hi. Um, they well, let's see. Um, and I can tell you that I have the, up here the colonists in a skirmish, and the next one after that is a uh, crescent of thunder. So, do you want me right. to go to crescent the of thunder? The co colonists first. Okay. Colonists. Yeah, we're in colonists in a skirmish. Yep. It's great. It's great that we have participants coming late because. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was how it was back in the revolution. Uh, the people were usually not early, and a lot of people were late. Uh, so it, it's good to come in on the action late. And this is just before the, the shooting starts, so that that's okay. Yeah, it's real life. <laughs> yeah, this is the reality here. Okay. Now, uh, one of my uh, theories that I write in my book is that not only were the 20... Uh, 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 light horse militia under Stryker participating, but there were some locals too that helped out uh, because there were several locals who were uh, notified and of course knew that the British were coming back up the road. And uh, I, I would believe that some of them were for, uh, from South Brunswick. And Seal Edom tends to agree with me on that. Uh, so let me mention uh, my note on that. Uh, for the others who may have participated in the skirmish, the genealogical information provided by Seal Leadham was most helpful. For the following surnames mentioned, uh, uh, an, a Gulick, uh, a pair of Quicks, uh, a Vores, two Barcalos, uh, and uh, uh, possibly a Lake or two, three Hagemans, uh, the Johnson brothers, and a trapper named Emmons, uh, who lived down by uh, where the Higgins lived, and possibly two DeHarts. Uh, so you see that uh, it, there is a possibility that there were more than 20. Now, history records that only 20 attacked uh, uh, the British, and of course that uh, makes it uh, sound a little more exciting than it was. But anyway, uh, even if you add these people, uh, they're still way outnumbered by the British who were guarding the wagons. Okay, now we're ready for the next one. Uh, Crescent of yeah, Crescent of Thunder. Okay, now this is the actual uh, 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 firing of the muskets, uh, and there are several accounts of a single volley fired at the British at 10 mile run. Snell's account reads as follows. At a preconcerted signal, the Americans set up a loud shout and poured in a volley upon the astonished soldiers, who, believing themselves to be encircled by an attacking force superior in numbers to their own, fled in panic towards New Brunswick, escaping with a few wagons which happened to have their teams attached, but leaving a great number in the hands of the Americans. Uh, there were other scholars uh, who uh, uh, confirmed this. Uh, Ketchum's account is colorfully done and to the point. Stryker had instructed his men to yell like fury when they opened fire, and the British guards, thinking they were attacked by a large rebel force, bolted away from their campfires and out into the night, never stopping to look back. So this was a pretty exciting uh, single volley uh, tactic uh, that worked, and uh, uh, now uh, the the militia were ready to reap the uh, rewards. 
Um, okay, you ready for the next one? Yeah, the next one up, I have a shot of Six Mile Run Church. <laughs> right, because um, after a couple of hours of uh, repairing some of the wagons that the British uh, had not yet repaired, uh, getting them serviceable to, uh, to move on along, uh, Stryker uh, leads his men up to the Six Mile Run Church. Now, he doesn't lead them up to Six Mile Run because that's a few miles further up the road headed towards New Brunswick. And he's going to veer off from Six Mile Run Church, and he's going to be headed uh, 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 to uh, try to catch up with George Washington and his men. Okay? Yeah. And then you have the picture of uh, 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 Millstone and Pluckerman. Uh, well, no, the next one up I have, a, I, I can go to that one, but I had a, um, one that we we're going to use for talking about Nixon. I don't know if you want to do that now or or, or later. Or oh, no, save, save that Nixon one for later, because he's not involved in this one. Okay, so what we're doing here, we have the, the Hamlet of Pluckerman. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's showing up right now. <laughs> So the route that uh, Stryker is taking, he catches up to the, the way that Washington is going, but Washington is already headed up to Morristown. Uh, so Stryker and his men got the wagons and they're going uh, through Millstone. Uh, they're going up to Pluckerman and then from Pluckerman, they're going to head up to Morristown. And uh, uh, Washington is surprised to see him and very happy. And the reception is really great. And uh, Captain John Stryker is, uh, uh, now becomes a hero uh, to Washington and his uh, soldiers, especially the blankets in the winter. You can imagine how uh, uh, happy they were to receive those. And Someone Randy, had, just, to finish, just, just to finish, and then we can have questions on the, uh, the, the skirmish. Uh, whatever happened to uh, Captain John Stryker? Uh, you don't have a picture uh, of this, but I just wanted to add it because I think it's interesting. Um, Captain John uh, was born March 2nd, 1740, died March 25th, 1786. Uh, the uh, other John Stryker, uh, Captain John's cousin, was born in 1745, and he died in 1820. Now, before the cousin died, he made large purchases adjacent to the farmstead along the King's Highway. Ironically, this land included the site of the skirmish. So where Captain John Stryker uh, succeeded in uh, chasing the uh, British away, it became land owned by strikers. And uh, that was passed down to uh, for several generations in the Stryker family. So there, uh, for for a, a while, uh, go ahead, Randy. Um, somebody had a question. They wanted to know if there are any Strikers uh, in South Brunswick today. Uh, the John Stryker, uh, when I wrote my book, I, I looked up all the Strikers. Uh, my wife had gone to... Uh, uh, Franklin High, and there were some strikers there. I think there was a striker from Kingston, uh, you know, the uh, Somerset County side. So there were uh, strikers in the area. That That's true. Uh, and there were strikers uh, uh, along the, uh, the, the, in the Franklin Park uh, area. But this okay. John Stryker, he has moved to Pennsylvania. But uh, several years ago when I wrote uh, the account, when I was doing the research, I found him in the phone book. And I called him up, and he and I didn't know at the time. But he said, "Yeah, I'm descendant of uh, those strikers, and uh, I have lots of information. And nobody has ever asked me to share that information." Wow, that's great. And about a half year after I had interviewed him and uh, uh, made copies of the information that he had in the genealogy on the strikers, he moved to Pennsylvania. Uh, so as far as I know, there are no strikers living in the South Brunswick area right now. Well, actually, somebody wrote in. There's a, a Keith striker who lives in Monmouth Junction, and he graduated from South Brunswick High in 2004. He actually works for the township, uh, somebody had written in here. So there, there, is, there is one. There is a, a young guy there, I guess. Right. Okay. And I would, so I, would guess, I would guess if his family's from the area, then he's probably... Uh, 
uh, one of the strikers uh, that's in this family that, that was featured in the skirmish. And there was a question somebody wanted to know was Six Mile Run Church moved at one time? Um, is, uh, is the Six Mile Run, run is one by Henderson Road on 27. There was a church, I believe it was a Dutch Reformed church at Three Mile Run. And that moved to its site where it is now, the Six Mile Run Church. They called it Six Mile Run Church because it was the closest church to Six Mile Run. Okay. That's what I know. But there, I, uh, I do not know of any church that was at the exact site of Six Mile Run. Okay. Yeah, and that needs to be clarified because a lot of people say, oh, Six Mile Run Church. Well, it must be where the Six Mile Run is, and that's not the case. Okay, it's just in, in that area. Yeah. Okay, I'm drinking a little water to get my uh, throat cleared. Uh, if there's any other questions, I'll entertain them, uh, but I'm getting ready for the next one. Uh, hello, uh, I have a question about Kingston. You know, that um, stone bridge and the mill. So I didn't exactly catch what you were saying. Was that stone bridge there during the revolutionary period? And about the, yes. is that like yes. currently occupied by like a, a regular resident? Uh, the mill, there are people living in the mill, yes. There's nobody living on the bridge. Well, I understand that, but I mean, the, the, the <laughs> bridge was like originally there. Uh, yes, that bridge, which uh, is lies between the mill and the new uh, Millstone Bridge, uh, it, if you, you can walk it, you can walk down from the road from Route 27, if you're on the Princeton side of it, and you can walk across the bridge, and that'll lead right to the lock tender's house, right in there. Uh, that is... That is the original bridge when George Washington was around, but remember it was repaired a few times. And uh, I believe in the research I did that it was part wood, there were timbers involved and stone. So it was timber and stone at that time uh, in 1776, 77. Oh, okay. So it's had many you know, different uh, constructions. Yeah. Well, so could you it was originally it was, it was originally a wooden bridge. They burned down. Uh, they replaced it with what I consider a wooden and stone bridge. And then finally, it, it was a stone bridge. And, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, of course, then it came out, out of use because it was too, too narrow, too small. And uh, they, they made the other bridge. So was bridge. there uh, some version of the mill house there at the time, way back when? Yes, yeah, so that, that mill was there. Uh, the British torched it uh, at one time. Um, and of course, that, that has been rebuilt. Uh, so that's not, that, the foundation and so forth is original, but, but that's not the original mill that you see there. That's, uh, that's a rebuilt. Deal. Uh, so do you have any information about the history of that house? Because I, I mean, I always find it striking. I go there a lot. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I have done a lot of research on it for my writing. And my second book was The Broken Bridge. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned a lot of history of that uh, in that. Uh, the Broken Bridge is, of course, about the uh, bridge being uh, dismantled by Washington's engineers uh, to delay uh, Cornwallis. Uh, but uh, the best place to go for information on that is the lock tender's house uh, down in Kingston. Uh, oh, okay, they, I, mean, I mean, just uh, to ask you, like, um, are the people that live there, do they own it or are they renting it or what's oh, the Oh, they're, they're, they're renting it. Uh, not all the floors are being rented, as I understand. Uh, Randy, you were down there with us, right? Yeah, last couple of years ago. Yeah, well, we took a tour there and walked on the bridge and we were asking about the mill and I was surprised that people were living in there but uh, there might be an architect who's living in there I don't know I, I forget what uh, 
the yeah. historian, the Kingston historian, said uh, about that. But there was, there's, there, there are uh, people living in that mill. Yes. So it's yeah, like I'm, I'm curious, like who would own that? I mean, if they're uh, leasing it, who would own it? Yeah, I'm not sure who the owner is now. But again, if you go to the lock tender's house, they can tell you all that you okay. need to know. Throw it in Google. Find it. Okay. <laughs> Maybe, Great. maybe. Thank you. I mean, I, I came a little late to this, but that's when I came in there. But that's very- That's all right. As long as, as long as your musket is good and your powder is dry, you can <laughs> come at any time. Well, my powder is dry. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Right. No, no, this, this was one of the best things you've done. So, I mean, even though I came in a little late, I found this uh, very fascinating. So thank you. Yeah, well, you could thank COVID for that because I'm not in my right mind. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm just rolling along here. Join um, the crowd. <laughs> I'm working on fumes, but I feel pretty good. And uh, I like the feedback. I appreciate it. Thank you. Join the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> this is okay, cool. Randy, are we all set? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I, could, I could add something to this. Uh, Kingston... The town of Kingston, particularly on the Somerset side, is a repository of artifacts from the Revolutionary War. And where the uh, early 1900s school now exists, and there's a Chinese uh, group that have taken over it, that field was used by the, the colonial soldiers to march. And it's loaded with uh, musket balls, fired and dropped with uh, colonial coins, which was Spanish reals and other kinds of coins from the 1700s. That field is a repository uh, to document that the Revolutionary War affected Kingston remarkably, and we're part of it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for that. Uh, I've often mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, where, where Washington stayed uh, uh, for, a, for a while gets, gets all the credit. Uh, Rockingham, uh, you know, that gets more press and publicity than Kingston does. And uh, as you say, uh, Kingston is a, a trove of, of uh, information around that time period. And, of course, for the canal, too, uh, in uh, 1830s. So... Uh, yeah, I, I would recommend people, uh, if they're going to uh, go to Rockingham, they might as well stop in Kingston, too, and check out the uh, historical sites there. Okay, Randy, are we set? Yeah, the next one is, uh, you know, it's the next section, and we have British regulars and Hessians. Okay, this is, now you're talking about the Cranberry Skirmish, right? Yeah, this is, um, well, actually, it's going to go into the, the Piney Woods of Monmouth County. So that's the yeah, slide well, after you're, it. You're, you're on the right track. You have the right string, but the wrong yo-yo. So, okay, so, so you're, 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 you're I can okay. go to Cranberry. You want me to go to Cranberry? I can go there. <laughs> Let me no, 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 no. That's, that's just the name of the second thing. Now, okay. I'm going to up on this because I noticed that the time is uh, we spent almost an hour on the one skirmish and that shows you how exciting this stuff is because we get carried away with this stuff uh, but I'll speed up on this and maybe we'll revisit this at a, at a later time uh, but we'll take in all your pictures it's just that my commentary and so forth I'll give you the short version okay okay Okay, so uh, you're showing the, uh, the first one. Uh, I'll introduce it. Uh, the history books, if they mention this skirmish at all, uh, this is the one that involves Captain Nixon, uh, they would call it the Cranberry Skirmish. The problem is that, I remember I told you before, the South Ward goes all the way down to the province line. So Cranberry and South Brunswick are really basically one and the same. Uh, the thing that makes this uh, uh, egregious as far as uh, South Brunswick is concerned is the skirmish had to have happened north of Cranberry, what we know of as Cranberry now. And that leads you into Wetherill's property because he owned uh, 1,600 acres and it spread out uh, in that area. So uh, Cranberry skirmish is a misnomer. Uh, 
if anything, this should be called a crossroads skirmish. Uh, but that's my name for it. And it could also be called the Captain Nixon skirmish. Uh, and I have a, uh, uh, a manuscript, which I wrote about it, searching for a publisher. And um, it explains the whole thing. But it's, uh, the, the skirmish itself is only part of the story. Uh, because it takes Nixon all through Monmouth County and up to Princeton and so forth and uh, is, a, is a long involved story. Okay, so we get started here. This skirmish occurred on March 12, 1777. Now by this time, a forage war is going on and this is what David Hackett Fisher has labeled this other war. Uh, the American Revolution is going on uh, but there's also a civil war going on. And that's where American patriots are fighting uh, British loyalists. And a lot of them are not military people. Uh, some might be militia, some might be just citizens fighting each other, hanging each other, uh, burning houses down, uh, robbing people, uh, all sorts of mayhem going on. And this forage war lasts from the beginning of the American Revolution beyond the end of the American Revolution. If you can believe it, you still had the thing going on, and finally it petered out uh, by around 1785-86. Okay, so that, that gives you the background on it. Uh, now I have to give you a definition for what are called the refugees. Uh, Randy, you're still on the same picture, right? Uh, yeah, I'm on Cranberry Creek, but I can uh, advance up to the refugees. I just have to. Okay, now wait a minute. Don't get carried away here. No. Uh, so where do you, where do you want me to go? Uh, what was your first picture you had? The first picture I had was British regulars and Hessians. Okay, hold on to that first. Okay. You want to get that, that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I got to get through a couple of sources and just a definition for refugees. Now, refugees back then is a lot different than our definition of refugees today. Uh, these were a peculiar sort of counter-insurrectionists who sought refuge in the forest and swamp areas, such as the pine woods of New Jersey <coughs> during the American Revolution. Now, these pine woods, a much larger area than what you think of as the piney woods today in South Jersey. And so you're talking about pine woods that are in uh, uh, the South Ward and in Monmouth County. And a lot of the people coming up from uh, uh, Monmouth County who were refugees were uh, uh, stealing things and raiding uh, people in M Middlesex County. From these hiding places, they ventured forth on raids to terrify locals, rob them, and traffic in contraband, uh, what was called London trade. Uh, and they were allied uh, informally with the king's forces. Okay. Now, uh, I based my research on uh, a couple of, uh, a, a few sources that are really strong. Uh, David Fowler, who was an archivist, uh, was an archivist at the Rutgers uh, Library. Uh, he wrote Egregious Villains, Wood Rangers, and London Traders, the Pine Robber Phenomenon in New Jersey During the Revolutionary War. I depended on his work uh, uh, a lot, and uh, this was the dissertation he wrote uh, for his doctorate. Uh, and then Harry M. Ward, uh, he wrote Between the Lines, The Banditti of the American Revolution. Uh, then um, I have The Other Loyalist, edited by Joseph Tiedemann. And then uh, Richard Maxwell Brown, Strain of Violence, Historical Studies of American Violence and Vigilanteism. And uh, <clears throat> then I have some other sources too. Okay, now you have a picture of the Piney Woods. Uh, and, yeah, and Monmouth actually County. that's up now, yeah, with the, Monty, the Monmouth uh, okay, County okay. Piney Woods. Okay, so that, that fits well. Okay, now uh, let me introduce you to um, uh, okay, this is number three now. Nixon, you, you have, uh, I don't know if you have a picture of... Uh, of oh, I have uh, somebody that, I, I couldn't actually get a picture of Nixon, but a, a slides back I have somebody that, as a representation of Nixon. But it's, I, it's a little I, ways back. I can get there. 
Yeah, um, yeah there is no point. picture of Nixon. Uh, as with several of these heroes, uh, no photography around at the time and not enough painters to go around. And these guys probably couldn't afford uh, a portrait of themselves anyway. So we don't have any pictures of them. You just have to use your imagination. I have a picture of a man, uh, an officer on a horse, though. Okay, well, that will now be our Captain Robert Nixon. He was probably coming from East Windsor, and more specifically, Heightstown. Uh, Heightstown was known in those days as Hydestown, uh, where he had business dealings and family. He and his wife, Rachel, lived near the bridge over Rocky Brook along Burlington Road, close to a mill. At the time, he held over 200 acres of arable land. Uh, he may have owned some land in South Brunswick. That's a maybe. Nixon was a tanner by trade. Uh, later, he operated his own tavern in Heightstown. And uh, he was the commander of a troop of Light Horse 3rd Regiment, Middlesex County, New Jersey. That means that most of his men were from Middlesex County, and several of them were uh, who lived in South Brunswick as we know it today. And he was commissioned as of January 27, 1776. So by March, he's in his third month in command of the uh, uh, horse troop. Now, a captain in those days was elected by his men. So this guy had to be somewhat popular. He had to be somewhat strong. And from what I've heard about him, he was also a nasty dude, a uh, very tough guy, not the toughest guy. You're going to hear about that guy uh, in a few minutes, but he knew which side the bread was buttered on, and he got first choice on that. Okay. Um, we're ready for the next one. Okay, well, we kind of skipped around, um, but I have the things about Nixon's lost diary since you're talking about about Nixon okay. now. Okay, Do you want good. To that? Now, I'll, I'll sum that up real short. Okay. My research would have been um, much easier if Robert Nixon's diary uh, had been available to me. And when I started asking around about this diary, because uh, some sources did mention a diary, and I had Seal Edom helping me out, we had to contact the people down in the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office, and they said, oh, yeah, Nixon's diary. Oh, yeah, no problem. So they started looking for it. They couldn't find it. Uh, months went by, and I kept bugging them. Seal was bugging them, and we weren't getting anywhere. And uh, it turned out uh, that the excuse was, well, we have the diary, but it must have been misfiled, and we don't know where it is. Now, the diary was probably not a diary. It was probably a log on a daily basis, a weekly basis, as to uh, all the uh, missions that uh, the horse troop went on. And they had several missions where they went hunting for uh, refugees. And so that, that knowledge uh, led me to come up with my own diary, which was uh, Captain Robert Nixon's lieutenant's diary which of course was all fiction, uh, but that took the place of uh, Nixon's lost diary. And uh, for a time there, just to get revenge, I was passing it off as a real diary. And of course the people down in Trenton wanted to get a hold of the, the lieutenant's diary. And so I played along for a while and uh, then uh, Sil Edom finally spilled the beans that it didn't exist. So that's the story behind the uh, the quote lost source. Okay, next one. Um, next one up, we have the papers of George Washington and have militiamen. Is, does that work? I mean, is that a right? Right, 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 right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now this refers to the um, uh, definition of the uh, uh, the militiamen, and uh, uh, it zeroes in on Middlesex County. Um, uh, New Jersey was required to form two regiments of militia and six companies of Minutemen. Minutemen had precedence of rank over the common militia of the province. On October 28, 1775, men capable of bearing arms were now directed to enroll themselves. 
They were ordered to furnish themselves with good musket or fire, lock and bayonet, which you guys have, sword and tomahawk, or tomahawk, steel ramrod, worm priming wire, all the stuff that's needed to fire the, uh, the musket. Uh, and uh, they were ordered to keep uh, one pound of uh, dry powder, three pounds of bullets. Now, the companies of light horse were ordered to be raised among the militia. So what they had to do was pick the best horse riders and those who owned good horses to be the horse militia. So these guys were uh, elite. They were uh, a step above the, uh, a notch above the uh, regular militia. Uh, there were four companies uh, in a battalion, and uh, there were three regiments. Uh, and, and so that gives you the background on that. Um, let me see. Okay, we can we can skip to the next one. Okay, where do you want to go next? Uh, cranberry. Okay, let me go back. All set. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> sorry for skipping around here. Yeah, I have a picture of a, cran a field in Cranberry and um, and the Cranberry, um, the First Presbyterian Church. Okay, yeah. good. Let me give you a background on Cranberry uh, as you serve as the Minuteman, always ready, always prepared. <laughs> okay, uh, Cranberry, originally spelled C-R-A-N-B-E-R-R-Y, like the fruit, uh, in New Jersey is located on the banks of the Cranberry River, also called the Cranberry Creek or Brook, close to where George's Road and Lowry Roads intersect. Now that's where the skirmish is going to take place, uh, right, right there, and that's that's Wetherill land. This stream is a tributary of the Millstone River. The name may have derived from the Scottish craneberry, which associates the stem of the fruit with the neck of a crane. Over time, the e was dropped, uh, and uh, then it, I have some information about the berries and so forth. You don't have to know about that. Uh, but anyway, this was a community that was established by the time of the Revolutionary War. And uh, uh, as I say, it sort of steals credit for the skirmish uh, with its name attached to it. Uh, but uh, we're correcting that uh, uh, tonight. Okay. Since Cranberry lay along a major lower road route. Okay, so this Lowry's Road... Uh, uh, be, uh, which connects the two capitals, uh, the Burlington capital to the Perth Amboy capital in the old days. This was called the Lower Road. And the King's Highway, which we talked about with the other skirmish, that was called the Upper Road. Okay. And uh, it became the second class road to the uh, King's Highway. That became the, the major main road. Okay. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Well, I could go on to, um, I just have a picture of a house in, along George's Road from the 1800s from our archives, or we can go to the Battle of Trenton. That's uh, coming up here, too. Okay, that's in a little bit. Uh, yeah, just zero in on that house. Like the one <laughs> on George's Road? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, Cranberry Inn uh, was the thing I wanted to talk about, because this is where Nixon and his men met. And in those days, it was called Hanley's uh, in or Hanley's Tavern, and uh, 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 Nixon uh, liked to meet there, uh, and this was, uh, Cranberry was sort of the headquarters for this horse troop, uh, and and uh, then, don't you have a picture of George's Road? Yeah, I have a picture of George's Road from maybe the 1800s, yeah, I, I'm showing that one right now. Okay, okay, so just north of Cranberry is the uh, uh, George's Road merging into Lowry's Road. Uh, you know that as the Cranberry South River Road, and it's also associated with Route 130, so they're all mixed in today. Uh, but uh, this was the main rag, uh, wagon road from Cranberry to New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, it was named after George Riscarrick. A lot of people think that George's Road named after King George. That's false. Uh, in 1686, George Ruskarek secured a warrant to survey 300 acres to conduct a house of entertainment for strangers and travelers. Uh, this became eventually the Cranberry Inn that is down there today. Um, okay, we're all set on that. 
Okay. Now we're ready uh, just to review the uh, battles of uh, Trenton and Princeton. Okay, we got the Battle of Trenton up here with George Washington. Okay, good. Um, now, um, George Washington is coming off a series of successes at Trenton and Princeton. British garrison suddenly withdrew their support from many of the state's loyalists early in the new year. So that meant that the refugees that we're talking about, uh, and they'll be involved in the skirmish, this uh, Cranberry skirmish, uh, they're, they don't have the military uh, support uh, that they had before uh, because the regulars have pulled back um, based on uh, Washington's victories. Um, now, uh, what we have here is, uh, the results of the first battle of Trenton, that's on December 26th, and the second battle on January 2nd of 77, and the battle of Princeton on January 3rd, uh, we have a trifecta for, uh, Washington. Some people will say that the Second Battle of Trenton um, was a was a, a draw, but uh, uh, with Washington outfoxing uh, Cornwallis and leaving him flat-footed in Trenton while he is sneaking up to Princeton, uh, there are others who consider it a uh, a very sly victory. Uh, so that's the scene that is being set as we uh, uh, approach this skirmish in March. Okay, and then um, you have a picture of New Brunswick? Um, yeah, let's see here. Let me just bring that up. I have to okay. skip around here. I, I'm really, uh, hold on a second. I have to find it back. Yeah, New Brunswick is uh, it's a bit back there. Yeah, I'll get there. Okay. Um, well, yeah, New we Brunswick, have I have the... a, it talks about Captain Nixon, Robert Nixon. And uh, it's a map of Middlesex. Yeah, sorry. Okay, that shows New Brunswick on it. Yep. Okay, now, uh, New Brunswick is, uh, for the whole area, this is the headquarters for the British in central Jersey. And uh, they are uh, uh, strong in New Brunswick and weak everywhere else. At one time, when the Hessians were down in uh, Trenton and along the Delaware River, along with some British and so forth, they actually had uh, a British uh, unit, uh, dragoons, I believe, in Cranberry. And, of course, they had them uh, uh, along the way. Uh, uh, They might have had some uh, in the Kingston area, uh, but they're all pulled back now. And, And so... Uh, the Americans are in basically complete control. They control Princeton, okay? Uh, General Putnam is there, and uh, they control Trenton. And uh, so all along the King's Highway and all along the Lower Road, uh, the Americans are, are, are gaining in strength. And the, real, the only real enemy they have are these refugees, these loyalists who are pillaging and robbing and that sort of thing. And every once in a while, you'd have some forage parties from New Brunswick coming out, uh, British and Hessian soldiers. Okay. Uh, then your next one is uh, what, the uh, troop of horse? I have uh, Nixon's, Nixon's militiamen. Okay, good. And um, what I have is uh, I'll give you uh, the names of the militiamen that I found <laughs> uh, there is Nixon's muster roll, and that indicates uh, um, uh, for a time, and that indicates many of the men that were in his horse troop. And uh, William Lloyd is one of them. He's from Upper Freehold. Um, you had Richard Bainbridge. Uh, you had uh, Obadiah Harper. You had Gershom Lott. You had Stephen Dean, and of course the Deans were big in the South Ward of, of uh, Middlesex County, meaning South Brunswick this time, and Stephen Dean was one of those Deans. Daniel Lott, uh, Charles Fisher, Peter Job or Jobs, 
uh, Ruskeric Moore, John Baraclough. There's another South Brunswick name. Um, then you had John Van Kirk, Peter Sutton, James Seagand, David Rhea. And several of those that I mentioned there are from South Brunswick. Okay, I think we're ready for the next one. Okay, uh, what do you want to concentrate on next? Uh, we have that's the uh, Lex Talionis. Yeah, it is it. Yep, that's what's I, up next. I? Yep, you're right. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, I mentioned before that this Nixon is a tough guy. Uh, now, in the story that I wrote, of course, I make him bigger than life and tougher than tough. Um, and uh, I give him some uh, uh, talents and skills that he probably wasn't that good at, but uh, he comes across as a very successful person during this time. Um, and one of the things that was going around in those days with this forage war was what is referred to as lex talionis. That's Latin for the law of retaliation. And you know it from biblical times, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And there are two uh, versions of this. The person who is put upon has the right to do the same thing to the person who was putting them down. The other thing is to get somebody else to do the dirty work for you uh, to carry out the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So Nixon saw himself, and he wanted his men to see be the same uh, with his eye for an eye justice. So if somebody does something wrong to you, you tell Nixon, and Nixon will take care of it. Uh, that was the type of guy that he was. Uh, but as Yogi Berra said, you can look it up. Lex Talionis. Okay, Randy, we're ready for the next. Well, I have a slide of the Battle of Princeton and then uh, about Van Kirk after that. So did you want to go to the, the Princeton or Van Kirk? Uh, I don't know. I'm on to, uh, what am I on to? I'm on to uh, Tory activists. Tory activists. Um, I have some things on Tories and, and loyalists before the Pine Barrens part, so I could go there. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm on to now. Okay. I have okay, a now. Of Tories. Okay, uh, there are many suspects uh, who are the enemies in this skirmish, uh, the ones doing the foraging. Uh, the one that historians uh, uh, sort of mention, and they they mention it lightly because they don't they don't really play this skirmish up too well at all is that these were uh, foragers coming down from uh, New Brunswick uh, British regulars and Hessians uh, and they were looking for meat and other stores uh, to, you know to get through the, the rough days in New Brunswick because uh, they, they were low on supplies uh, but the other option, and the one that I prefer, and the clues sort of indicate it, is that these foragers were coming from Monmouth County and raiding in uh, uh, the Middlesex County area, especially the South Ward. And uh, a lot of the foraging that they did uh, uh, coming from Monmouth County would, would be then they would take whatever they got, and uh, especially cattle and horses and stuff, and bring it up to Sandy Hook. And then it would be uh, shipped over to New York. Uh, so uh, that's also a possibility here. Okay. Uh, and then you, you have some information about the pine uh, robbers, the pine bears. Uh, yeah, it's, it's later on. But, you know, I was thinking we could do the pine robbers and William Laird and Devil David and everything. But I was thinking maybe we could um, split it up and, and continue this on for another one because then we could talk about everything within the pigeon swamp it's coming up on an hour and a half and yeah. um, I think let's, I, we, we should split it I think maybe a good place to end for tonight would be either William Laird because of you know Applejack that's a nice tie-in or Devil David I, I guess you know <laughs> whichever one you'd like to what do you think of that idea though okay I'd like to save Devil Dave okay so we'll talk about um, we'll, we'll end it with Laird yeah why not and, okay so uh yeah, I just had the information on the pine robbers. 
So we'll move that, and now we'll move to uh, Laird. Now, one of the other uh, uh, horse uh, soldiers was William Laird. Uh, he joined in February 1st, 1777. Um, he uh, is probably the brother of Richard Laird, who was also listed as being in the same outfit. It appears that William Laird served under Nixon until April 1st, 1777, so he could very well have been in, uh, involved in this skirmish. Uh, Laird hailed from Englishtown, New Jersey. He married, uh, was married to a daughter of James English, a uh, founder of the town, named after him. Uh, census records of 1778-78, they show a William Laird living in the freehold area of Monmouth County. And, of course, these Lairds, uh, the descendants of, of these Lairds, uh, were uh, famous for their Applejack. And uh, that's one of Randy's favorite beverages, so he wanted me to make sure that I mentioned that. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll stop there because this is, this is a tremendous amount of information. And uh, we'll pick up on this. Uh, now, we have... Well, September, we have the roads. We're going to do the history of the roads. But, but we're, go we're taking a break in August, though. Yeah, we're taking a break in August. In September, we do the history of the roads. Okay. And then October, October, we can get back to this skirmish. All right, sounds like a plan. We'll do that in October. And uh, also, I'm going to mention about we're going to have a, um, a scavenger hunt uh, in October. And we'll go to the different historical sites in South Brunswick. So I'll... Just everyone stay tuned for that, and I'll send everyone a message about that. But that's another thing that will be happening in the fall. So, uh, right. so stay tuned. Okay. Now, do you want me to give the background on Pigeon Swamp, and then you take it over from there? I was thinking that since we're already at an hour and a half, um, it'd be better to, to split that off until next time to get everything, you know, these, uh, okay. Uh, you know. Okay, just, just roll with it. Yeah, the reason we're ending with Pigeon Swamp is because that's where Nixon chased the uh, foragers too, and yeah. they were trying to hide in Pigeon Swamp. So Randy's going to take it over from here just to describe the Pigeon Swamp thing. And oh. as I say, we'll, we'll get back to this possibly in October. You want me to do the Pigeon Swamp tonight or next time? Oh, you want to do the Pigeon Swamp next time? I think it'd be better because we could really give it, you know, I think it, it deserves a, it's, its time in there. We could talk about the other things with the weather all and Half Acre Road and everything. Right. So, yeah, I, okay. I think we should pick that up for, yeah, um, yeah. that'll be in October then. So, this was your tease uh, for next yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. We'll find out all get, about Pigeon Swamp. <laughs> the people salivating. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, well, open it up to questions, and we're all done for this evening. Okay. Anybody, you can open either turn on your mic or just put it in the chat box. Somebody had a question. They wanted to know if there are any skirmishes by Longbridge Farms. That was an earlier question. No, uh, no there I were no skirmishes by Longbridge Farm. The key historical thing that I've been trying to indicate to people in South Brunswick was that's where Washington's army encamped before the Battle of Monmouth. And therefore, uh, in several on uh, several acres, of the Longbridge farm, because that was over a thousand acres, and and uh, the largest farm uh, probably in the area rivaling Wetherill's farm, uh, was where the encampment took place. Um, I believe it was the night before the Battle of uh, Monmouth. Right, that uh, is when it was. Yeah, and that's historically uh, accounted for because George Washington paid Thomas Wetherill uh, for expenses. Uh, and that's that's documented. Uh, and and uh, it's also interesting that Longbridge Farm uh, was a, uh, uh, a horse raising uh, uh, operation. Um, they had they provided stud service. I mentioned that in the, in the notes here in the second half. Uh, and so Washington was able to get some fresh horses there at Longbridge Farm, too. So but that's what that's known for. Not for a skirmish, but for an encampment. I, I have a question. Maybe it's beyond this. It's uh, the you talk about the different phases of militia, Minutemen, and I guess to throw in there is the Continentals. Who determined? How was it determined who went into what 
sector of the military? Was it age based? The younger guys going to the Continentals and the kind of middle aged uh, guys going to the militia? Well, there, there was a volunteer nature to it. You could sign up for anything. Uh, <clears throat> the thing was, uh, based on your skill level, and there was another thing too, your experience. A lot of the guys who were signing up had no experience whatsoever. You take an example like Cadwallader's uh, Pennsylvania Volunteers. Uh, they're late getting to the battle of the uh, first battle of Trenton. They actually don't make it across in time. Then they get there for the second battle of Trenton. But Washington knows that they're inexperienced. So he lets them in a second line. And, and these are probably the, the most inexperienced guys at the Second Battle of Trenton. Fortunately, he doesn't let them fight. But then he gets to the Battle of Princeton, and Cadwallader is bugging him to get into the battle. So he sends them in, and what do they do? They get panicked by the first soldiers, the British soldiers that come in at the Battle of Princeton, and uh, they retreat. And some of them ran completely away, uh, never to return, never to uh, continue with Washington up on through Kingston and all that. Uh, so it really was based on what you volunteered for. You, you can volunteer for the regular one. Uh, you can volunteer for the militia. You can volunteer for the Minutemen, whatever the case may be. It was wide open. And some guys were doing this. They get the, the bonus money. For one, then they desert and then they sign up with somebody else and get more bonus money. So there was all sorts of games going on. Anything else? No, I don't see anything on the chat just yet. Okay, so we'll stay tuned. And like I said, we'll pick up on this subject in October. And in September, we'll be doing uh, the origins of the names of the roads in the township. And uh, right, we'll... right. We have to do that. We're honoring a request from uh, one of the listeners. And we'll do that in September because that's what I'm gearing my research for for next time. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have a plan and we'll also have the scavenger hunt too. That'll happen in October. There'll be more news about that coming up. Okay, we're very busy, and it's good to keep busy. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to enjoy the rest of my quarantine. Everybody stay healthy. All right, good night, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Good night. <coughs>